Hello church. I pray that all is well with each and every one of you as we continue to go ahead and move forward with our study of the book of Acts. Um, I hopefully you were blessed by uh, Pastor uh, Rufus Singleton over the last couple of weeks who talked to you from Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 6. I know I was truly blessed by it, but hopefully you were as well. So this week we will look at chapter 7. Um, really don't have any news for you guys as per se. Uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you are aware that the governor has uh, reinstituted his restrictions on indoor gatherings. So therefore, we will not be meeting anytime soon. Uh, I was hoping and praying that we could meet together soon again in person, uh, but doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. So uh, with that, we're just going to open up with a word of prayer. Father, we just want to thank you once again for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And Father, on this day, Father, we ask forgiveness of all sin. We don't want anything at all to hinder this prayer, Father. We, we pray that the minds and the ears and the hearts of your children will be open and receptive to what thus says the Lord, Father, as we continue our study of the early Christian church, Father, in particular, Acts chapter 7, Father, this week, Father. Uh, one of your first martyrs, Father Stephen, Father, who died for the faith. So, Father, bless this time. So, may all things unto you. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, we start here in Acts chapter 6. Um, and this section that we're going to be studying right here is um, actually like a history lesson. And so, the title is Stephen's Speech to the Sanhedrin. We see here in verse 1. Uh, Stephen says, then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? So the high priest was probably Caiaphas, the same man who had presided over the Sanhedrin trial of Jesus. Uh, Stephen begins to give this, if you would, the high priest a, a history lesson, if you would, of the life of the Jewish people and, and how everything pointed back to Jesus. So he goes on here in verse 2, and mind you, we have over 60 verses to go ahead and cover today. So we're going to kind of speed through these so that we can make sure that we get them done in a timely matter within an hour. So right here in verse 2, uh, we go on here and we see uh, Stephen says, To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. So the God of glory uh, had intervened in history again and again to speak to his people. When God first spoke to Abraham, it was not in the temple of Jerusalem. It was not in Palestine. In Stephen's view, God is independent of every object, animate or inanimate, and he reveals himself to every creature, to any creature, and in any mold or in any place. So Stephen used the Old Testament, which was something that the high priest and the Sanhedrin court understood. They understood these things. They couldn't wrap their mind around the idea that God would speak to ordinary people, right? Just to the priests themselves. They couldn't understand that, that God would speak to whomsoever, not just people in a highly position, not just people who were supposed to be anointed by God as these high priests were or the Sanhedrin court, but to whomsoever, which brings us to point number one. Point number one, God speaks to ordinary people, right? God speaks to ordinary people. Quick story, I mean, when I left my old church, um, I had many people call me as to why I left the church. You know, they thought it was maybe over some incident <clears throat> or something that happened in the church. And I, I hope and pray that, that no pastor, that no minister would ever leave a church based off of an incident that these are people that have been anointed by God, that God speaks to, and you're not going to make any decision, not unless it's led by the Holy Spirit. So I had to explain this to people, and these are people that are in ministerial positions, ministers and pastors, and I couldn't believe that I had to explain to them, okay, if you would, uh, the reason why I left is because God had told me it was time to leave, right? I'm not going to make any decision based off of my own feeling. It's going to be led by the Holy Spirit. So Stephen goes on here in verse 3 and 4, and he says, uh, Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of, Can of the Canaanites, of the Chaldeans, excuse me, of the Chaldeans, 
and settled in Haran after the death of his father. God sent him to this land where you are now living. So the text does not explain why Abraham uh, settled in Haran or, or where the promised land, when the promised land uh, was Canaan. So all we know that Abraham chose to wait for his fathers to die before he journeyed to the promised land. And we see that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The scripture tells us, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Again, that's Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. So Stephen moves on here in verse 5. And he says, He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no children. He gave him no inheritance, but God moved Abraham along his spiritual, uh, spiritual pilgrimage, if you would, from blessing to blessing, but possession was not the goal. Apparently, since God would not allow Abraham to settle down and to stagnate in God's present blessings, God will continually, okay, listen to this, God will continually test you to see if you will be obedient and listen to him when it doesn't make any sense at all. And this is exactly what happened with Abraham. And this is the point that Stephen's really trying to drive home here. When God wants to bless you, to move you from your current situation into something that he has much better in store for you, something that he can't, something that we can't even imagine. I mean, was leaving my old church difficult? Extremely difficult. I don't know what it's like to be divorced. I've never been divorced, but I mean, I could only imagine, uh, you know, uh, what being divorced is like because when I left my old church, I mean, it hurt really bad. But I have to be obedient to God. As a matter of fact, my old pastor used to always say that if it's easy to do, it's probably not of God. But if it's difficult to do, it is of God. And we see the same point that Stephen's trying to drive home here about Brother Abraham. So we go on here in verse 6, 6 and 7. And scripture tells us, God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. That's just insane when you really think about it. But I will punish the nation. They serve as slaves, God said, and afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Before uh, Abraham's descendants would be allowed to enjoy the land of their home, they would be tested, if you would, they would be tested in a furnace of affliction in a foreign land for 400 years, enslaved and mistreated. That's just really crazy when you think about it. I mean, but God warned them that it's going to happen, right? Once again, we see God testing his people that he loves. We move on here in verse 8. Now, I'm kind of going through these things. Like I said, we have over 60 verses to cover today, and I want to make sure that we get through them all. You know how we do it here. We're going to make sure that we cover the entire chapter um, and not skip anything at all. So we move on here in verse 8. Scripture tells us, Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. So the covenant uh, of circumcision was the symbol given to Abraham that he might never forget that God had promised to bless him, if you would. The sign of this promise was translated from generation to generation, from Genesis chapter 17 all the way to the time of Stephen. That's what we're seeing here, the confrontation with the Sanhedrin. Uh, Abraham was what? Was saved by faith and faith alone. And we see that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Scripture goes on here further and it says, And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteous. And that comes from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he was counted to him as righteous. Talk about Abraham, right?
right? And the symbol of the circumcision was an outward sign demonstrating the genuineness of his faith. So this was a covenant relationship. This is symbolic uh, that the circumcision was a symbolic symbol, uh, something that he was supposed to pass down from generation to generation. We move on here to point number two. Point number two, God will bless Stephen's audience, not because of their circumcision, but what? But because of their faith. God will bless Stephen's audience, not because of their circumcision, but because of their faith. So we move on here to verse 9. Scripture tells us, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him. But God was with him. The patriarch refers to uh, Jacob, the grandson of Abraham and his 12 sons. The name Jacob, meaning uh, Usipur, uh, was changed by God to Israel, meaning something like God's defender, something like God's defender. The 12 sons that we talk about here were the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? That's where we get that 12 tribes of Israel were the 12 sons. Verse uh, 10 and 11, and rescued him from his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him rule over Egypt and all his palace and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. So the famine provided the means of bringing uh, Joseph's brothers to Egypt in search of grain, and, and more importantly, the, the reconciling of uh, Joseph to his brothers, right? Now, he actually reconciled the relationship that was once broken uh, because of Joseph's brothers selling him into slavery. And God has his ways of using uh, many what we consider a bad situation into something good. Uh, he has complete control of everything. As I've said before, some good will come out of this coronavirus pandemic that we're experiencing right now. Believe me, God is still in control. We move on here to verses 12, 13, and 14. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit, on their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. So Stephen stated that 75 people uh, were uh, went to Egypt, actually. And, but and we see that in Genesis chapter 46, verse uh, 26, Genesis 46, 26. I want you to pause right now, pause the video, turn to there in your Bibles, and we're going to look at this a little bit further because it actually indicates that 66 people accompanied Jacob, right? So where did Stephen get this 75, right? So not, uh, so the 66 people that accommodated, uh, that accommodated, uh, accompanied uh, Jacob to Egypt, it not included Jacob, Joseph, and his two sons, the two sons of Joseph. Uh, so Stephen got the number 75 from the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. The translators apparently uh, added the nine wives, and we see this in Genesis chapter uh, 46, verse 26, where Scripture says us uh, the number 66 did not can, did not include the wives in that in that 75 right that's where we get that 66 back in Genesis but it was only nine and not 12 because the wives of Judah and Simeon had died Joseph's wife was already uh, in Egypt so there we come up with this number 75 if that makes any sense at all so that's where he gets that number 75. So we move on here to verse 15. Verse 15, then Jacob went down to Egypt where he and his ans and our ancestors died, right? Their bodies, no, verse 16, their bodies were brought back to Shechem 
and placed in the tomb that Abraham had brought had bought from the sons of Hamron, uh, Hammer, at Shechem, for a certain sum of money. So, we ask the question. I'm back up here. We ask the question: Why did Stephen make the point that the patriarchs were buried in Shechem? Valid point, right? I mean, why would he even bring that up? Why did Stephen mention that? At the same time, Stephen's defense. Uh, Shechem was the center of, Samar of uh, Samaritan life. Uh, it was nearby, was uh, Mount Gershom, the site of the another temple, right? And we see that in John chapter 4, verse 20. So Stephen was charged with uh, speaking against a temple in Jerusalem as if he was speaking against God himself, right? That's what he was actually charged with. So Stephen's point was that God had always been speaking and moving in the lives of his people in and out of Jerusalem with or without the temple, right? <laughs> when they were in the wilderness, they weren't in the temple. So the most important address that, that God made to his people was what? At Mount Sinai, which was nearby Jerusalem, uh, which was nowhere, I'm sorry, which was, was, uh, what was nowhere near Jerusalem, uh, much like the church today, right? The church today is just a building that we worship in, that we praise in, but us as a body of believers is the church itself. And really think about it. Think about this. You know, when Jesus taught, right, he didn't teach inside a building. He generally taught outside, right? So, you know, so we, we get our mandates and we get our example from Christ himself. Uh, that's kind of like why I really enjoy outdoor service, uh, because it kind of reminds me of Jesus' teaching. But anyways, the church is just the, the, the building itself, uh, but we are the body of believers that actually make up the church. Otherwise, that is just a building. Amen. So we move on here to verse 17, 18, and 19. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dwelt treacherously with our people and opposed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. Wow. Abraham's descendants enjoyed prosperity and great uh, growth that uh, proved threatening to Egypt uh, and to Pharaoh, uh, who did not know Joseph. So that's why they did these things. So we move on here to verse 20 and 21, 22. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family when he was placed outside Pharaoh's daughter, took him and brought him up as her own son. Verse 22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of Egypt's of the Egyptians and with powerful and was powerful in speech and action. I found that pretty interesting, especially that last verse that Moses was educated in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action, okay? No person has ever been given attention uh, in the Jewish tradition than Moses has. It is said that Pharaoh initially had no sons. Therefore, Moses was being prepared uh, by Pharaoh's daughter to succeed the throne. For this reason, Moses was educated in all wisdom of the Egyptians, as we see there in verse 22 that he just talked about. I mean, later, Pharaoh did have a son. The Ramses right of his own who succeeded him uh, instead of Moses. The Jewish tradition also stated that Moses became a great captain among the Egyptians, leading them to victory against the uh, Ethiopians. He was also powerful in speech and also in action. We move on here to verse 22 or 23, 24, 25, and 26. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. 
he saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came up upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Wow. When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. So we know that Moses went to Midian. He met his wife, Zipporah, who was actually black. Uh, she was Ethiopian. She was uh, from the tribe of the Cushites. So we know that she was uh, Ethiopian. So anyways, he had two sons. And in the opinion of many Jewish rabbis, uh, 40 years was the age when a man had grown into maturity. So Moses' life, uh, Moses' life was, divided into three parts, okay? So we see the scripture here. I kind of messed up a little bit, but I'm pretty sure you guys all have your Bibles open. So um, it's divided into three parts. That's what many Jewish rabbis believe. The first part, the first 40 years in the palace uh, of Moses, of Pharaoh, right? Uh, we're actually, actually preparing him for service. The second 40 years were in the desert, and the third 40 years carried out God's will to deliver his people. So, uh, really a long time. <laughs> you think about it, you know, uh, that's 120 years, right? So, but God was preparing Moses for something that he had in store. And I, I've always thought about that, too. I'm like, okay, we know Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, Moses was in Pharaoh's palace for 40 years, in the desert for 40 years, and then the third 40 years carried out God's will of delivering his people, right? Because they wandered in the desert for 40 years. I mean, does all this stuff correlate? I think so. God is a God of, of, of um, consistency. He's a God of order. So I think all these things kind of come into relationship. Moses began his period of the wilderness training after he tried to free the Israelites in a way that God had not chosen. Uh, and we got to be careful about uh, doing God's work in God's way, right? We have to do it in his way. We have to do it in God's timing and for God's reason, okay? It has been said that Moses spent 40 years thinking about uh he was somebody, right? <laughs> then he spent 40 years finding out that he was nobody. And finally, he spent 40 years finding out what God could do with somebody who was nobody. As I've told you guys before, it just blows me away that everything I've done in my life, that God still decides to use me. Um, it just really blows me away. So I'm truly thankful for that. But we know that God has a plan and a purpose that he can use somebody uh, who was nobody, right? I was absolutely nobody, but God chose to use me as somebody that he can truly use. And I think that's our testimony anyways. So we move on here to verses 30 through 34. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flaming in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Verse 33, Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. I have Indeed, seeing the oppression of my people in Egypt, 
I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. In relating to the burning bush incident, uh, Stephen once again understood the fact that God is free to reveal himself whenever he pleases, wherever God does, the ground becomes holy ground, right? Wherever God does, wherever God dwells, that ground is holy ground. So let's just talk about Jewish history a little bit. I mean, political change can actually lead to change perspective on history, <laughs> much like what we're seeing on in our country right now. Uh, the destruction of the Jerusalem uh, and its temples by Rome in, in, in um, 70 AD forced the Hebrews to radically rethink the significance of Jerusalem and its institutions. And Stephen and his fellow Christians had already departed from the uh, earlier Jewish view uh, that the world revolved around Israel, which in turn revolved around the temple and the law, right? They were still hung up on these ideas, but they were slowly drifting away from them. They knew that everything turned back to Jesus. I mean, they still saw, saw Jerusalem as the uh, more than just a city, but they made it into a new symbol of a higher idea. Now, Stephen's view of history brought the conflict between the new movement and the city fathers to a head, outraged the council's stone Stephen to death, as we'll see uh, later on. And we see the Apostle Paul, who was, who was actually Saul during that time, uh, starting to persecute believers. And Stephen's perspective on Jerusalem challenges us as modern Christians to reflect on our own loyalty to our institutions. I mean, with this coronavirus pandemic uh, virus that are going on, are you still live streaming? Are you still watching online? Are you still coming to the outdoor service? Have you drifted away by still committing to the institution of the Grove Community Church? Which leads us to point number three. Point number three, our highest allegiance must be what? To Christ. That's bottom line. Our highest allegiance must be to Christ. Let's move on further here. Starting in verse 35, this is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to the rulers, to their rulers, and delivered uh, and delivered by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the burning bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise, listen to this, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from his own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our ancestors, and he received living word to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. Crazy. Unbelievable. After everything they've gone through, turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who <laughs> led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That's just crazy. You know, I'm, when I read these stories in the Bible, I'm actually there. I'm going through these things. I'm listening. I'm a spectator. So for them to make that comment, after everything they've seen, after you know, all these signs that God showed Pharaoh to release his people out of Egypt. They walked through the Red Sea on dry land, and this is how they respond. Unbelievable. Stephen point out that Moses, the very uh, one the, the Jewish leaders accused him of speaking against, as we've seen last week by Rufus Singleton in chapter 6 of Acts, chapter uh, verse 11, He's rejected by the leaders, forefathers, as God appointed leaders and redeemer, just as the leaders, what rejected Jesus Christ himself. It was this same Moses who spoke of the coming of Jesus in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Check it out for yourself. Stephen challenges the religious leaders of his day either to believe all of what Moses had taught 
or none of it. He makes a statement, our fathers would not obey. I mean, Jewish commentaries of the Old Testament calls rebellion involving the golden calf, that unspeakable deed. The rabbis did not want to talk about it, forbidding a translation of the account into the language of the synagogue service. The Jewish re uh, religious leaders wanted to bury the incident, but Stephen what? Stephen wanted to dig it back up, right? So we move on here to verses 41. And so we begin. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and revealed and, re and revealed in what their own hands had made. <laughs> Crazy. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the patriarch of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings for years in the wilderness, people of Israel? Have, you have taken up the tabernacle of Moloch and the stars of your God Rephim, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness, right? Ten Commandments. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. So the ancient tabernacle had been the focus of the Israelite national worship, right? If you would, even after the miraculous deliverance uh, from Egypt, there was a tendency among the people to forget God's presence with them. The tabernacle was a cut was a constant testimony of God's presence, no matter where the people went. I mean, Paul tells us we are the tabernacle, right? The temple of God. We see that in First Corinthians chapter three, verse sixteen, that we can never move out of the presence of God. We carry His presence with us, and we see that again and again in Scripture. We see it even in Psalm 139. So we move on here to verse 45. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them. When they took the land from the nations, God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, verse 46, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, verse 47, but it was Solomon who built a house for him, verse 48. However, the Most High does not live, listen to this, does not live in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, right? What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or where will my resting place be? So it was David's desire to give God a permanent dwelling, if you would. The, the danger that David requests was uh, some might identify the presence of God with one place as if God was confined to uh, a particular location. So God honored David's desire by permitting his son uh, Solomon to build the house and filling it with his glory, which is a demonstration of his presence. But God does not live in the temple. The creator cannot be confined by anything, okay? He has made his self known. He is omnipresent, right? He's all around us all the time. His presence fills all that he has made. And Solomon understood this when he dedicated the temple. And we see that in First King, First King, chapter eight, verses twenty-seven through thirty. In his speech, Stephen emphasizes that God could not be confined to the temple made by hands. That's the point that Stephen is really trying to drive home here. We move on here to verse fifty. 
Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. This is Stephen getting really personal now. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. Unbelievable. And now you have portrayed and murdered him. Verse 53, verse 53. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. Wow. I mean, this is just, Stephen's just really cutting them deep. I mean, Stephen right here, what he does, he put the council on the spot, right? The, the members of the council wanted to appear open to God's truth, right? But they and their ancestors rarely wanted to hear God's truth through his messengers, right? Just as he said before, God can speak through anybody. And Jesus made this same essential charge against people also. And we see that in Matthew. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23 through verses 34 through 36. That's Matthew chapter 23 verses 34 through 36. You can go ahead and pause the video here and turn with me in your Bibles. The scripture tells us, Therefore I am sending you a prophet and sage and teachers, some of them you will kill and crucify, others you will flog in your synagogue and pursue from town to town, and so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zach, um, Zachariah, son of Berkiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. That's Matthew chapter 23, verses 33 through 36. Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 through 36. So Stephen didn't shy away from accusing the uh, accusers of the Sanhedrin uh, of handling Jesus over to death and ultimately accusing them of becoming his murderers, right? <laughs> he, that's basically what he's doing. I mean, he used uh, even stronger language than Peter had. Uh, we've seen uh, several weeks back in Acts chapter 3. I want you to look that up on your uh, own because we're running out of time here. Acts chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Acts 3, verses 13 through 15. So we move on to our next section here. The stoning of Stephen. The stoning of Stephen. I mean, Stephen the martyr. In the book of Acts, the infant church uh, faced opposition from both actually Jews and Gentiles. But with every wave of persecution, uh, which is just really amazing, the church grew more and more. In hardship and trials, Christians depend increasingly on the Lord for strength and guidance. In doing so, they demonstrate what their faith to others as an example, right? When you're going through situations, when you're going through circumstances in your own life, believe me, church, people are watching how you handle these situations, okay? And it's our job as Christians, right? as Christians who understand the word of God, to lean on him, to know that our faith will carry us through. I mean, Stephen was one of the seven men chosen to minister to the needs of the neglected of the early church, became the first martyr of the, the Christian uh, faith, but he wouldn't be the last also, right? Uh, although falsely accused of blaspheming Moses and God, his unfair treatment, and violent death would serve as an example to persecuted believers throughout centuries who would face similar circumstances, who would face similar trials for upholding the name of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts tells us that right after the stoning of Stephen, 
a zealous young Pharisee named Saul, right, continued to persecute to persecute uh, the new faith by hunting uh, its members down and imprisoning them to face similar circumstances and similar charges for what? Their faith. Although Saul trying to stop the spread of the Christian faith, other eventually persecuted, such as the Roman Empire and Nero, right, who reigned from A.D. 37 uh, on to 68, he cared little about the blaspheme of the Jewish deity, right? Nero was simply looking for an escape goat to blame uh, for the, the, the great fire, if you would, at that time for his destruction of Rome in AD 64. Uh, so he wanted to blame the Christians for that. He was simply looking for an escape goat. So that's why he wanted to persecute the Christians. Uh, later, Christian martyrs would face a similar death uh, and hand it over to fellow believers, okay, to so-called believers, if you would. And we see that with William Tyndale. William Tyndale lived between uh, the years of 1494 and, and 1563. He was actually burned at the stake for heresy because he dared to translate the Bible into English language, right? That's just insane. That's just insane. I mean, here it is right here on the screen. William Tyndale was burned at the stake for heresy because he dared to translate the Bible into English, the English language, making it more accessible to the common person. In 1856, we hear of a story of five American missionaries who were murdered in the jungles of Ecuador by headhunters, right? And, and here's the thing. This same tribe was eventually converted to Christianity through the persistence of missionaries who, by their perseverance of the martyr missionaries who had gone before them. So even though these five people had been murdered as martyrs, later this entire tribe became Christians, right? That's just really amazing. I mean, God has his way, as I said before, of turning a bad situation of what we may consider a bad situation into something good. So we see Stephen's death. Um, the countless Christians died for the witnesses of the truth of the gospel, which leads us to point number four. Point number four, we should always set our eyes on Jesus instead on this world. Always keep our eyes on Jesus instead of this world, right? We move on here to verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. <laughs> but Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So Stephen at this moment, he was full of the Holy Spirit, which is evident by the fact that all he wanted to do was what? To please God. I mean, he was consumed only with doing God's will by responding to this uh, terrifying moment in a way that he wanted to what? That he wanted to glorify him. And Stephen's completely trusted the Holy Spirit to empower him to respond in the proper way. You know, his whole action, his whole speech was totally led by the Holy Spirit. So we move on here to verse 56. Verse 56, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, which brings us to point number five. Point number five, gazing at the death might be terrifying. Okay? Gazing at death might be terrifying, but gazing past death to the presence of Jesus waiting for the believer is what? Is the hope that dissolves fear. That's just good stuff. I want you guys to just pause right there for a minute. I mean, gazing at death might be terrifying, but gazing past death to the presence of Jesus, waiting for the believer, is a hope that dissolves fear. That we aren't fearing death. We aren't afraid of death. You know, toward the end of my father's passing, I believe that he was kind of afraid of dying. But, uh, you know, as time grew near, 
uh, to his passing, actually two days before, he totally repented of everything. He was at peace with everything. And that's the place that we should all strive to be. And we have the opportunity to glorify God in the face of death, boldly declaring our confidence in the fact that we will spend what eternity in the presence of God. Stephen uses the title Son of Man as a similar uh, to the Lord's description of himself in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, uh, as he describes himself. And also we see it in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. The scripture tells us, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a man, one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was present before him. So we see that same terminology presented there as well. So we move on here to verse 57. Verse 57, and we're getting ready to wrap it up here real soon. At this, they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 60. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said, when he had said this, he fell asleep. So because Jewish law did not allow the execution within the uh, walls of the holy city, the, the religious leaders uh, took Stephen outside the city walls. Jewish custom was uh, that the first witness would push the condemned person face forward into a pit. Uh, sometimes it would be 12 feet deep. Uh, if this man survived the fall, right, <laughs> then the body would be turned over and, and large boulders would be thrown down to crush the chest and the ribs of that person. Uh, and then if he remained alive, then stones would be thrown by the whole congregation. The situation may have been a little difficult uh, with Stephen, perhaps due to the executioner's urgency. The text indicates that Stephen knelt, right? The Stephen knelt, as we see that here in verse 60, right? So we know that he wasn't pushed down in the ditch, uh, in this 12-foot ditch, as you wish, which was actually customary, uh, but actually he was on his knees. Uh, Stephen's work was done. He was immediately ushered into the presence of Jesus. And for that, we are truly blessed. And, I mean, look at the last statement, though, that Stephen says here. He says, Lord, do not charge them. I mean, that's just really good stuff here. In verse 59, Lord, do not charge them. Unbelievable. As Jesus had done, Stephen also requested what? Mercy for his killers. That just really kind of sets up an example for us as Christians that we shouldn't hold anything against anybody that persecute us. But you know what? Ask God for their mercy. So we're, we're going to end right there. We've covered 60 verses. I didn't think we are going to be able to get through it in about in an hour. But actually, we got through it in 50 minutes. <laughs> so we're actually under time. So hopefully you've been blessed by this week's lesson. Uh, next week, we will pick up in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. God bless you. Love each and every one of you. We will close with a word of prayer. Father, we just want to thank you once again for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you, Father, for the example of the early Christian martyrs, Father, in particular Stephen, Father, and even asking mercy for his uh, persecutors, Father, those that had condemned him to death, the same example that you have given us as well, Father, that we should forgive those who persecute us, uh, who uh, or against us, Father, that we may, that we may ask for mercy on them, Father. It's my prayer, Father, that whoever uh, doesn't like us as Christians, Father, that they will draw into a full acceptance and belief in you, Father. We know that love covers a multitude of sin, that you are love itself. 
So, Father, we ask that you bless each and every member of Legacy. Father, that you continue to go and walk with them as we go through this coronavirus pandemic. Father, we thought that it was getting better, but it's just getting worse. And Father, we don't know what you're doing, but we know that one thing, that you're in control of everything, just as we've studied in this week's Bible study lesson. So, Father, we want to thank you once again, Father, for setting an example for us. Father, we want you to know that we love you so much and that we honor you and that we adore your holy and your righteous name. And we pray all of these things in the mighty and masterful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen, amen, and amen. So I'll see each and every one of you uh, next week. Uh, stay blessed and not stressed. Love each and every one of you. Uh, as before, we've always said, if you got any questions, concerns about anything, feel free to contact Pastor Nolan, uh, myself or the church, mainly Pastor Nolan, right? <laughs> but Pastor Nolan, myself or the church office, we love you guys. We're here for you. We can't wait to meet together in person again. Hopefully, we'll get through this thing sometime soon. So until next week, we will see you soon.